chat with our guest, Bethany Weigel. Um, she's a colleague and I would call her a friend. We had a great time working together. Um, but that aside, we'll get right to it. If you don't know much about Artifact, um, we're a strategy and design firm. Um, we help companies to plan for the future. And we create the products uh, and experiences that get them there. And we do that through a lens of what we call responsible design, uh, meaning we're not only designing for users, but for positive impact across stakeholders, society, and even the world in which we live. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you're interested, this webinar is a part of our Impact by Design series. So if you're interested in attending more events virtually or eventually in person, sign up at the link in the chat. Um, and I'm the host, I'm Eric Krosky. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm an eight year artifact vet, um, been here for a long time, worked on a wide range of projects. Everything from helping Steve Ballmer and his team at USA Facts to give government data more context uh, to a reimagining the education you receive after being diagnosed with diabetes and everything in between. Um, one of the most rewarding projects uh, I got to work on was a project called Baobab with Bethany and her team down at ASU. It was a dream project um, in many ways. It was focused in the learning space, which is something I'm super passionate about. Um, and it really helped to think about decentralized learning. Um, between 2016 and 2018, uh, Artifacts and ASU worked together to design and ship Baobab. And cut to two years later, uh, now we're all facing new ways of communicating and collaborating. And we at Artifact reflected on our work on the, the platform and how it's been impacted by how our work in general has been impacted by COVID-19. We thought of our partnership at ASU and the platform we worked on together and just wanted to they're already decentralized uh, users to the tools to adapt to college life without a campus. Um, so while Baobab has always been focused on some traditional, non-traditional modalities of learning, um, we want to have a conversation with Bethany to hear about her team and how it's impacting Baobab and its users, which are MasterCard scholars, um, and how they're adapting to the access and equity and the barriers presented through remote learning. Um, so Bethany, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Eric, and thanks Artifact for thinking of the Baobab project and our partnership uh, to talk about um, these realities, how students can learn online, uh, especially in light of the fact of COVID-19. Um, the world's changing quickly and it's been um, interesting to be kind of at the forefront of online learning. Um, I am Bethany Weigel, Senior Director of Grants and Emerging Initiatives at Arizona State University. And uh, my team is housed within EdPlus, our digital uh, learning uh, central service unit for all of ASU, um, which means that it houses um, ASU online, but all so, uh, several of our special projects like Baobab that we'll talk to you about today. Um, and in particular, my unit actually takes um, human-centered design approach for educational problems for a variety of different entities around the world. Um, and we um, receive questions at hand, something like what should a sustainable alumni strategy be for international scholarship recipients or Emirati youth aren't ready to uh, begin higher education upon graduation. And, and my unit comes alongside a partner who's trying to solve that problem to help um, go through the design process iteratively, um, really to make sure that we are inclusively designing for the problem at hand for our learners um, and addressing those problems, learning from um, our, uh, our products and improving them continuously as we um, watch and experience our learners um, receive impact from our design and then continuously improving them. And so and in each cycle of the phase, we're designing interventions, evaluating their success and impact for students, learning from that, and then redesigning and in, um, uh, adapting to what we learn. Um, and so that's kind of my unit as a whole. Um, but today in particular, we're gonna talk to you about a MasterCard Foundation case study, um, and which resulted in the Baobab platform. 
But before I can fully explain the Baobab platform to you, I just have to tell you just a tiny bit of the background. Um, and there's 30,000 scholars that the MasterCard Foundation has invested a billion dollars to provide full ride scholarships at the high school, undergrad, or graduate level. Um, and, and this large group um, needed a way to connect with each other. They're all from Sub-Saharan Africa. They're all committed to positive change, um, but they're at 27 different institutions on nine different time zones and no way to connect. Yeah, when we designed, the, uh, when we began the design process, the scale of potential users really, um, it was clear from the outset, we, we need to design for different levels felt inclusive to everyone in all nine time zones across the continent of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and make sure that they didn't feel like they didn't belong, make sure that they feel like they belonged on the platform and that we didn't create a platform that where people felt outcast or on the outside. Um, and that really forced what we called our A-team, get it, ASU and Artifact, um, to really rely on responsible uh, design decisions in order, in order to achieve equity for people. And around that, um, we knew what the problem at hand was um, and our vision centered around a digital social learning platform that could unite this group, um, connecting them to tools, resources, and the professional relationships they would need to succeed as they transition from their scholarship program to professional life. Um, and ultimately make impact in their communities within Sub-Saharan Africa. And so beyond the, the, um, the community that, that Baobab offered, we also felt it was really important to drive education from non-traditional forms of learning that have been evangelized by the web today. So we looked to things like Reddit and how they were conducting Ask Me Anythings. We also looked at Facebook groups because these are all different ways people are learning now. Um, and that, that was really important uh, for the platform so that it didn't, it felt like it was both top down and bottom up. That's exactly right. And we also just really emphasize the understanding of our particular user group um, using that human centered design approach when we uh, began uh, starting focus groups and understanding the barriers to engagement. We learned that there was really going to be a limited access to technology and data. So we needed to create just in time, short, uh, valuable pieces for them, um, be able to use a social learning platform for 15 minutes at a time. Um, and that time was also a limited resource for them. They're working on their scholarship, they're starting their careers. And so once again, we would have to design something low tech and um, low data and highly valuable within a short amount of time. Yeah, these barriers um, became a very unique set of design constraints. <laughs> um, we were designing for a mobile first audience um, with a wide uh, variance of access to devices and technologies. Uh, as an example, before we would ship any code, we would test it on devices you would normally not really test on, meaning devices that were three years old or devices that where we would run Opera Mini, which is the code um, and making it as low bandwidth as possible before serving it to the browser. And our human-centered design approach also uncovered some primary motivators of our users. Um, the theme kept coming back up over and over again that they wanted mentorship, um, that they were worried about what their future held for them, and that if we helped them find a job, if we helped them find a mentor, that they would be on the platform, they would be advocating for the platform, that it would be valuable to them. And so we took those as um, design information to how we ultimately built Baobab as a social learning platform that addressed both their barriers and their motivators. The voices of the people who'd been there before really helped to connect Baobab to scholars. Um, and throughout the design process, we didn't only interview scholars, we also interviewed African professionals who years before um, were often in the same shoes as our future Baobab users. Um, and that, that was that was really helpful in just kind of understanding the different angles in which um, we would need to consider the scholars and accommodate their needs. Yeah, that's a really good point, Eric. Um, 
when we got started with this project, there was only 100 alumni of the entire program. So in some cases, they didn't even know what they needed. And so expanding who we were interviewing to understand um, even the components of what they might of our, what our potential users might not know they needed. Um, and so really just believed in the human centered design approach and the collaboration with Artifact to, to make sure we were designing something that would be used um, by our alumni as they understood it, but then also as Af for African professionals, um, what would be valuable to them. So I'm just going to show you a little bit, uh, just a, a smidgen of the functionality that uh, is live on Baobab today, and um, we'll um, have some discussions on, on how we're adjusting uh, in light of COVID as well. Um, so this is the feed. It's the central repository of um, when a user logs into Baobab, um, they're greeted with a a uh, variety of posts from all of our users. Any of our 7,000 users to date can post, comment, reply, tag. Um, they can uh, learn from each other, meet each other uh, here on the feed. Um, so Bethany, I, I'm curious just about how, um, how the scholars have kind of embraced their community, especially one that's spread across the globe. Um, and just what the recent conversations on the platform have looked like considering um, the state of the world today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, with all tech uh, innovations, there's always those early adopters who come in, they understand the mission, they want to lead the community, and we've really leveraged them on Baobab. They are now ambassadors. Um, we have, we buy them a shirt. Um, we send them stickers and pens and facilitation guides for them to bring on other uh, scholars onto the platform to benefit from that. And so we have kind of these hubs of community that then expand across the network. And our ambassadors at each of these different institutions have now created their own channels and their own connections with each other um, so they can collaborate together. Um, I think one of my favorite anecdotes of how people are leveraging Baobab and the community at hand is uh, we had one scholar uh, ask for collaborators. Um, he was traveling to Rwanda and he was looking for people who could help him build chair out of recyclable materials. And so he has the instructions and the know-how, but he needed someone who had a certain amount of plastic bottles, the fabric, the cushion. And when he arrived in Rwanda, he had found all of the collaborators he needed on Baobab and had built um, this beautiful chair. Um, out of recycled materials. So really kind of demonstrated the, con the concept behind the community that it's not just a place to meet, it's a place to collaborate and it's a place to make positive impact and to demonstrate the power of the network. Um, in light of COVID, I think our users are increasingly interested in how their learning journeys can continue and their institutions might have temporarily closed. Um, there's a number of questions about well-being. Um, and conversations around the stresses of the time. Um, and Baobab has become a place of solace for our community where they know that there are 7,000 individuals who are kind of living the same reality as they are um, and that they can reach out to them to receive encouragement and support. Wow, that's, I mean, so when we set out, I, I've never kind of imagined the, the kind of impact that like, just the the story of building a chair and being able to connect with people that have the materials like that's such a, a, a really it's a really cool thing yeah and it just demonstrates this power of the network if there's seven thousand individuals instead of finding a collaborator among a billion on facebook it's seven thousand young africans committed to change there's enough to find your collaborator but small enough to actually find a relevant collaborator yeah so another piece of functionality that um, was top of mind and completely in line with our barriers and motivators of our users, um, and you mentioned before, inspired by Reddit, um, this Ask Me Anything concept where we could invite experts from a variety of different fields and experiences to come on and answer any questions asynchronously. Um, we run them for a week at a time so that regardless of what time zone you're in, um, you can ask your question and you can get your answer. Um, uh, from these variety of African experts. Um, what experts have you brought in to help scholars transition to more digital learning? Yeah, well, um, what's actually been really interesting in light of COVID-19 is that um, a 
in early March, there were a lot of questions and even some assumptions on um, some fake news uh, that was getting posted on, on Baobab. And we, uh, we responded very quickly. First week of April, we had a public health expert on answering questions about AMA, um, asking, answering questions about um, COVID-19 and the realities of, of how to keep yourself safe. Um, questions of whether or not Africans are more or less susceptible. Um, and we've continued our series weekly so that we always have, we had a um, medical doctor from Ghana reporting on COVID for an Ask Me Anything for the second week. Um, and then we adapted to well-being and we had uh, mental health specialists coming on and answering any questions as um, the world has just changed drastically for all of us, um, but making sure that we were using Baobab to um, provide support to the community at hand um, when they might not have access to the support that they would normally have at their institution. Um, there's been a variety of interest on online learning too, to your, to your point. Um, and we have hosted well over 60 experts on the platform doing Ask Me Anythings from entrepreneurship, um, online learning, scholarship opportunities for the future for these users. Um, and so it's a really flexible functionality that enabled us to adapt in light of COVID. Um, and I'm sure that online learning is gonna continue to be a topic. Um, in fact, we're um, building an, uh, how to be a successful online learning, online learner as one of our courses on Baobab. Um, we currently offer 30 courses on Baobab. They're on soft skills, entrepreneurship, um, career readiness, like your CV and resume, interview support. Um, but we're getting ready to deploy the best practices of online learning as we have such a huge community, community that's adapting from in-person to online at such a rapid pace um, in light of the new realities. Yeah, and you, uh, you mentioned earlier that there are several, several barriers to engagement um, prior to COVID-19. How have they changed uh, since? Yeah, so um, a number of our students could no longer stay at their institution and were sent home. Um, and at home, they don't necessarily have as reliable of internet as they would on their um, university's campus. And Baobab, while it is a digital only solution, and in, in many cases, digital has become the primary solution, um, that wasn't always an option for our scholars who were sent home and didn't have internet access. Um, data packages are way too expensive. Um, and so um, to, to that end, we took um, some of our most important courses and we made PDF versions of them so that uh, learners could consume and continue their learning um, opportunities here without um, access to a high bandwidth solution. So all of the videos in these courses are transcribed in the PDF um, because that's usually the most data intensive component. So that's been one big adaptation. Um, we've also, um, next week are going live in an SMS notification system where we send users who don't have reliable internet but do have their phone um, quick links to downloadable PDFs of our AMAs um, and low other low bandwidth offerings um, in response to um, this very unique population that couldn't go digital first um, in a normal sense, needs to go digital first because of COVID, but needs to go in a low data digital first solution. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I mean, I think, I think you have to think about like, when you think about low bandwidth, obviously, when we first started creating this, we um, we we were focused so heavily on the web. It's really great to hear that you guys are now starting to transition to SMS notification because of that. I mean, this just increases equity. It helps to create increase access, and it helps to make sure that people remain connected through a a, a more difficult time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm sure that we'll continue to, to adapt. We're tapping into the larger ASU online resources um, in order to serve our students. And just as another example, many of our universities um, shut down their, um, their campuses. And when learning paused, we stood up uh, an Excel course and an Achiever Capability soft, um, soft Skills for Employability course that were created by ASU faculty so we could have ASU branded certificates as credentials for our learners who don't have um, the opportunity to continue learning but are still able to reach Baobab, um, continue their learning there and receive ASU branded credentials for 
workforce ready skills. Yeah, yeah, um, that's super. Uh, that's awesome. Um, I think that 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 is just um, so helpful. I think to think about how just literacy and how to um, how to um, really help to build those skills. Right. Um, I think that's I think that's good. Um, so I wanted to hand it off and say let's spend the rest of the time answering questions. We only have eight minutes. We ran a little bit over. Um, it looks like we have a question already um, from Taylor it's asking, of all these dynamic components of the platform, how many were designed from scratch and how many use other services? Um, and a bigger question, big on my investment. I think we could probably both answer that question. Do you want to take it? Sure, I'll just um, start with um, uh, what I showed you today is um, the AMAs, the feed are all custom developed, um, initiated by Artifact. Um, and uh, since, um, since we have transitioned from Artifact, we've integrated um, two very big pieces of existing open source code. We use OpenEdX as our learning management system that's integrated via API to the custom portion of Baobab. Um, and we've also integrated in Rocket Chat, which is the open source code that works a lot like Slack. And um, those are the three main functionalities, the custom Baobab components that really were designed to work well in Africa and we needed it to be custom because a lot of stuff um, from the US is clunky. Um, but Rocket Chat and open source um, uh, and open edX, we tested to make sure they perform well in Africa and they did. And so we cut costs by using those open source codes integrated into Baobab. Yeah, I think, I think one Taylor to one thing that's super interesting about this platform is just the level of data privacy we wanted to create. And that actually was one of the main drivers for building our own. Else. I mean, I'm, I guess I don't know if this is still true, but I would assume so. Um, all the data is, was stored in a different country so that it would be served to Africa quicker. Um, but at the same time, um, for privacy reasons as well. Um, we have a question from Felix, who Bethany, uh, Bethany you may remember. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Felix. Um, <laughs> what is your advice for people or teams working to scale community engagement? How do you imagine COVID will impact secondary education and community building in the fall and beyond? What factors or measures should organizations consider? I think that that is a really, a really great question. I think um, secondary education um, and community building in the fall is gonna, there's gonna be um, much like we've seen in our own work, um, collaboration is going to change. And I think that actually introduces a question that I also have, which is what like what tools will become really prominent for education? And I think one thing that Bethany had made that she, I'll let her that, that could have on learning. Yeah. Talk a little I'm sure everyone knows that Zoom has become the most wildly popular thing and Slack's doing really well too. Um, we actually saw our ambassadors initiate their own little community um, Zoom sessions. They advertise them on Baobab and then um, wanted to be able to video chat with everyone. So seeing the faces has become just a really critical component. Um, and there's a lot of tools out there that um, can deliver um, that a feeling of community. Um, how do we imagine COVID will impact secondary education? Um, ASU is definitely thinking about that. Um, we created a new website, asu4u.edu. It has um, all of our online resources, and the hope is that a variety of them might be utilized by a high school who then can facilitate and dive deeper into the concepts. So receive the online learning, but then in a flipped classroom sort of way, um, invest um, in, in the community and answering the questions with the, with the teacher um, on Zoom or, or anything like that. Um, and um, I'll just go back to human-centered design in terms of factors and measures should organizations consider, consider your user and design for them. 
um, you know, what we've implemented for Baobab today is because of what our users needed. And if we picked um, our own things, we would have used stuff that, that, that wouldn't have worked or wouldn't have met their needs. Um, it would be a state of the art, really cool thing because Artifact and ASC would have had a lot of fun building something, but um, it might not have, it might have used too much data, um, for example. I think I think one other thing that's super interesting to think about in the context of of how how we're all kind of doing these panels now and uh, thinking about thinking about collaboration. You have to consider to make sure that they're. I lost you, Eric. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm really um, helped. Um, workload. Can you hear me now? I can yeah. now. OK. Um, Sorry about that, everybody. Um, essentially, what I was saying is don't only use human centered design, consider things like access, things like inclusiveness, um, and make sure that, um, in the case of the scholars uh, and education in general, workload management is going to be a really big thing. So, I just I think design can help to reduce barriers, but I think in light of being one asynchronous and two um, decentralized or more decentralized now um, making sure that you're not adding to the burden of of learning will be really important um, it is 12 29 um, so i just want to say thank you so much to bethany for um, joining and chatting it's been a pleasure catching up um, say hi to your family for me um, and thank you, Jasmine, who is uh, uh, the marketing uh, point of contact for both of us. And she helped to facilitate it, put it on our calendars. Um, so thank you so much, Jasmine, for facilitating this. Thanks for the conversation and thanks for your time. It was it was a great idea and love chatting. Yeah, have a good one. You too.